So um, thanks for being here, everyone. Showed up, I, I apologize for showing up a minute or two late. But I got caught in the airport traffic. Anyway, we got a lot to cover today, some interesting things to cover today. So let's uh, call the meeting to order. And with a uh, roll call to establish our quorum today. Natalie? Steve Weeks? Present. Tanya Fairley? Present. Yolanda Jimenez? Present. Colette Kavanaugh? Present. Jacob Rostovsky is absent today, but we have a quorum. Excellent. Do, well, do we have um, public comment on every item? Yes. Including the uh, minutes of the last meeting. Right. After the motion. Exactly. All right, let's move to item number two on the agenda, the approval of the March 13th, 2023 committee meeting minutes. Oh. We're starting with number two. Great. Is there any, has everyone reviewed the minutes of the prior meeting? Any comments? If no changes, do we have a motion to approve? I motion to approve. Thank you. Good. And a second? I'll second. All right. And do we have any uh, move to public comment? There doesn't seem to be any public comments, so we will uh, go for a vote. Natalie, will you call the roll? Steve Weeks? Yes. Tanya Fairley? Yes. Yolanda Jimenez? Yes. Colette Kavanaugh? Yes. Motion passes. Excellent. Let's move to item number three, uh, recommendation regarding renters within licensed establishments. And Christy's going to give us some background to this, so I will turn it over to Christy. All right, thank you. Good morning. So this topic has come up quite a bit recently in um, our office. And what it is, and we wanted to bring it to the committee to discuss about what we might want to do in the future to address this. But we are finding more and more um, establishments that are renting out single rooms. So a little different than a booth renter who goes in and rents a station within the establishment. This is a, a hair salon that is renting to an esthetician, for example. And that esthetician takes on that extra room within an establishment and that's their business. They get a business license from, from their city. They completely operate solely as, as, the, um, as their own establishment. Now, when we have the Sola type Phoenix salons where there's multiple suites, every one of those suites has an establishment license is issued to it. And what we have always based um, this on is because the mail, the post office recognizes it as its own address. Mm -hmm. But when we get into these establishments that are just renting a room, they don't have their own, own address. Mm -hmm. It's the same as, an, as the establishment. So um, I think we could do something in regulation if the, if the um, committee decides to make that recommendation. But I think we, ha we should discuss it and address it because they really are operating as their own sole business. Now, booth renters slash independent contractors are as well in their station, but they cross over, like for instance, a... Um, a stylist, a cosmetologist who's renting their station and the person next to them is renting their station but they're usually using the same shampoo bowls and that's always been a struggle in the past. We've tried to, um, many times in Sunset, we've brought up the issue of booth renting. We've um, asked for booth renting um, certificate or license for those stations. Mo a majority of other states do have some type of booth renter um, 
notifi you know, certification or license. And what those boards have done is, is um, established common areas. We have tried that in the past. We haven't been successful um, with the legislature in getting something um, in, in statute to be able to do this. Um, but I think this is a different model now, and I think it's becoming more and more common where they are renting a room and it's a suite in the back of an establishment that are truly separate businesses and there's no crossover. That esthetician doesn't ever leave that room to go you know, work at a hair station. It's their business in that room. So that's kind of what we wanted to bring to this committee to get your thoughts and see what, what others think and see if you feel that the staff should pursue this further in trying to um, come up with some type of regulations. We haven't discussed this fully with um, our our regulations council. So we would have to determine if we do really have the authority to do that. I think we do. Um, but if should the committee decide to go in that direction, what we would do is we would look further into this subject and bring a formal recommendation back to you with language that then you could um, recommend to the board. So I have a question um, because I am, as you guys know, I have my own salon. Um, and I do have this scenario in my um, establishment. I do require, of course, they have to have their own business license and, and all this thing. What I find to, and I'm just giving you like a, an insight on what I find the, what would be good about this and then what would be a, draw, a drawback. What I think would be good would be, it would be in line with it being really their own establishment, their own business. Um, they have access and entry to come into the establishment. They have to enter in through the main door, um, but then they have their own door there. What I would wonder is, would the liability now shift from the overall establishment or to that individual establishment? If they got their own license, does that mean like if state board come in and they want access to that room, there's no access being granted because that is truly their own separate entity. So that would be my first, um, my first thing, the separate entity. Um, I think it's a good idea because we treat them as their own business anyway. So then the, if that's the case, I think the liability should be solely on the person um, who has that room in that space. And I think from staff's perspective, that's where we're coming from. I don't think it's really fair that we hold the business responsible if we can't get into the esthetician room that's solely their business. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's what we address in, in this process is that liability. Because I, I think, um, you know, we've gotten better with some statute changes that we have where we try to hold the person who actually committed a violation more responsible than the owner. Um, but this is still, if we came into your salon and your esthetician's not working and their door is locked as it should be, that's a violation for the owner. Which I think is unfair right. because they have and have requirements for their own sanitation purposes and their own personal space that no one should be able to go in there and, and, right. and touch. Um, I think in this day and age too with everyone being classified as their own business, um, it takes some of that ownership off of the overall establishment owner. Um, even in my renters that I, well, I don't have renters anymore. I've changed that. Everybody's hourly now. <laughs> but when I did, they all had their own business license and they still had the responsibility of having their insurance. So each one of mine had their own personal um, property insurance mm -hmm. um, for liability purposes. So this would require that renter to carry all of the same things as the overall establishment would carry, and I think it's a good idea. I'm having trouble with the microphone today. I have a question. How many uh, new establishments, do you, have, do you have any idea how many new establishments this would create? Oh, a gazillion. <laughs> Don't anyone look at James right now, who's our <laughs> licensing manager, who just probably is like, he's going to kill me. Probably a lot. Well, because you have to. I, <laughs> I would think so. I think what it, what, you, what it is is that there's one thing to have booth renters, 
right? So one salon can have 25 booth renters, but that one salon inside of that 25 booth renters could probably have one or two or three room, separate rooms. So it may not create an abundance in a cosmetology side, but probably more on the esthetician side, depending on what the scope of practice is, would make a, would make a difference. Um, yeah. And, and just, you know, we, this is going to take some time, mm -hmm. James. So this is, this is a, you know, we'll have to do regulations. We'll have to really research what, how we want to make this happen. We're going to, you know, if the committee decides they want us to bring back language, it might not be perfect when we bring it back to you. So it's going to take some time for us to do that. But we have to start somewhere, right? No, I think it's actually, I think it's a, I mean, the more I think about it, the more I'm like, please. <laughs> but on the flip side of that too, um, you know, it's just, I think that it's creating more independence and taking away some of the barriers that some of our room renters um, run into and salon owners run into of being fined for a room being locked because someone else is in there. Um, so... Would it, um, and to Tanya's point, because I agree with what she's saying, um, so, because usually if, like, so like, the esthetician is doing stuff out of their scope of practice, would that just keep the liability on the esthetician and not the owner then? So they wouldn't have to. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Correct. Like that. Yeah. Because, I mean, they're busy. They're own, running a business, and it's kind of hard to, like, go and audit right. their room and right. stuff. Yeah. No, I agree. And especially if it is their own business, it's really not allowed. <laughs> what are you asking for here? Are you asking that this be sent to the board to discuss? Nope, just the committee's, um, I don't know uh, if we need an, a formal motion, but it sounds like everybody is in support of us bringing back some actual language. Absolutely. Right, right. It would be basically asking the staff, look into this, talk to right. regulatory council, see what it might look like, and then eventually, maybe not very soon, but come back with some language. Right. To this committee? Yes. Yes. Okay, okay just, is, is that a motion that someone wants to make? No. We don't need a motion. Oh, okay. good, good. Let's go to public comment now. Good morning, Fred Jones on behalf of the Professional Beauty Federation. So mixed minds, we have consistently over decades supported the idea of the separation. We believe you know, our sole mission is to raise the professionalism of beauty. And we've had a long history of willful or ignorant lack of clarity when it comes to whether someone's an employee or truly independent. Um, so I came to the board years ago with uh, the code section that defines an establishment. It talks about a part of a building, so it doesn't have to be a full building. And I made the argument that even a booth renter should have their own establishment license. <clears throat> so one of the concerns I have with this, by the way, which is well-intentioned, um, I always try to look at the unintended consequences. What I worry about is if you're going to talk about physical separation as kind of a demarcation of whether you need an establishment license or not, and therefore a mere booth renter wouldn't qualify for that, is that sending an unintended message to the more traditional approach of booth renting that you're not truly independent? Um, you know, why is four walls and a door make you independent, but renting a space and maybe sharing some common space doesn't make you independent enough? <laughs> um, and given the, I think this is largely ignorance, not willful violation, the already problematic situation between an establishment owner acting like an employer over booth renters. I think the last thing in the world the board should do is muddy that water even further by saying, okay, here's a whole group that are clearly independent. They need an establishment license. But you booth renters 
who some of you incorrectly assume your establishment owner is your seconds. employer, uh, don't need this. Um, so the, the devil will be in the details. Obviously, we'll be here to uh, help participate. I think the intentions are great. Thanks. Thank you, Fred. All right, so let's move on to our uh, next matter uh, regarding the uh, ownership types. And Christy, you want to? Uh... I'm sorry, I said, oh, Jesus, because I read this and I was like, wait, what? <laughs> Christy, you want to brief us on this? I sure will. So um, we did provide some backup in your packets of a situation that we are having um, many, many years ago in a land far, far away. We had um, a decision that the way our statute is written right now would include an, the ownership type of an LLC, limited liability company. company. <laughs> um, and we've been processing applications that way for at least 16 years. That's um, Carrie and I searched our, our archives of our emails and found the um, information that went back 16 years. I've been here for 18 years, so um, I, I don't know that it, I think it was even done before, before me. Um, and now, as we're going through regulations for um, new, um, new regulations that we're currently working on, for example, the mobile unit cleanup for SB 803, um, it's come to our attention that we don't have the authority to issue an establishment license to an LLC. Um, and so um, we stopped and it blew up. Um, I actually had no idea how many of our establishments were LLCs. <laughs> um, so we have, um, I've worked with legal, the legal office. Um, basically, there's a corporation code that says no, um, a professional service can't be offered by an LLC unless it's clear in our statute. So basically, for us to make it clear in our laws, we have to go to the legislature and ask them to put the words limited liability company in our statute which I highly recommend we do. Um, there are many, many, Absolutely. many LLCs, <laughs> many. Um, and um, it used to be few and far between, I think. And I think out of sight, out of mind, we've real, we discovered over the last month or so that um, it's not few and far between. So should the committee um, agree with um, there's no concern about an LLC? I don't have any concerns from board staff perspective. We've never had a concern um, come up. And so I definitely think it's something we should move forward and go to the legislature and try to get that clarified in our, in our language. Yes, I mean, that, that, that's good. You get no argument out of me. <laughs> the only question I have oh, no. is, I think, I was, as I was looking over our current regulations, I have a feeling that maybe it would make sense to modify some of those and force disclosure of individuals that are now hidden from our required corporate. I mean, yeah, if Steve Weeks wanted to uh, get an establishment license, that's one thing. If he lost his license through uh, disciplinary action of the board, you would think I would be out. But really, all I have to do is establish LLC. a corporation without my name on it, because one off one person can be all officers yes. for a regular corporation. And they hire me. They bring me in. They have me as a stockholder. They have me as an IC. I, I just think it's a bit of a loophole that 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 those people that are troublemakers in our profession can can use this loophole to get right back in the profession and i think we may be able to solve it just by adding some language saying that if you have had prior discipline uh you, it has to be disclosed if it, it's going we get noted we don't even see bylaws when they come yeah and i think so, well um 7347 the establishment um Establishment um, license. Um, am, am I okay? Um, <laughs> it does include word. I think it can be also cleaned up because it does include words to the effect of um, when you apply. If um, they they ask like information about officers, you know, 
partners, that kind of information. You too. do. It does ask yes. that, but does it doesn't ask for your licensing if you are prior licensing right, or right, anything. Right. So, so I think that's what Steve is trying to say. Right. Like if you if if we're gonna do well, I mean I'm an LLC for my stores. <laughs> I mean for my salon. Um, and it says on there, it just has the name of the LLC, no no name to follow. So I think yeah. that's a good the, the managers to disclose members. Yeah, the manager and members, that's who we would have to ask mm -hmm. about. But I so think that's I, part of the discussion with the regulatory council and right. and and because that would be yeah, I think we could would show up. Aside from the LLC issue, I think there's a lot of cleanup we could do because even in sole proprietorships, right. that's right. one of our biggest issues. They just put it in their sister's yeah. name. Exactly. So I think we've we've had some discussions in the past about this, so I think we could dust that off and, and bring that back. So we can bring back to this committee some um, drafted legislative language, and, um, and then that can go to the board, and we can start pursuing um, a legislative change. That would be great. And also we could, uh, any voluntary or involuntarily dissolved corporations we should know about, too, because mm -hmm. we could be... Licensed under a corporation that's been dissolved seven years ago. Yep. I mean, you know that. Very so true. Where, where this would all work within the uh, framework of what we discussed on our item three? Um, oh, yes. Okay. Yes. And again, no resolution on that. Nope. Okay. And public comment? And there's, there's, there's no public comment. And there's no motion needed. So let's go to the uh, uh, item number five. Recommendations regard to implementing a, a 90 day retention schedule for out of state license uh, certifications. So this goes to, um, obviously we are basically license for license in um, our state. So if you have a license in another state, you can come to California and we'll issue you a license. What we've experienced for years and years is that someone will go to their, their state and ask for the certification letter to come to California. We get the certification letter and then they don't apply with us for sometimes close to a year. Mm. We want to make sure that that certification from that other state only sits in our office for 90 days. Mm -hmm. We felt that was a decent enough time frame that gives them enough time to get that that application in um, because you know if it's seven eight months we don't know what's happened to that license in that time frame so we they have to have a valid license so we want to limit the time we keep in the um, keep that certification active in our file in our office question what what constitutes 90 day versus 60 days or 45 days or 90 days seems a long time for our industry for a license changeover? I don't know. I just want to know what we I think, um, do you have any? I think we just picked it. We, yeah. I wouldn't go less than 60 because we want to allow in case a backlog happens to occur in our okay. office with certifications. Um, but I, I would be comfortable with 60. So my question to you is when they um, bring in the certificate for the license, what is the process? So you get the certificate, and then do we verify that the certificate is still like? What does that process look like? Yeah. So the certificates come straight from the states. Okay. Um, we don't even accept them from a, a applicant. They okay. have to come from the states, and most of the states have agreed to do that because there's so much fraud in certification letters. So they come straight from the state. So once, um, and then usually we get a high number of our applicants for reciprocity applying online. So what we do is when, they, when we're processing those applications, we pull up their application and then we file them electronically by state and by name. So then we go when we search to see if the certification has already been received and then we match the two up and issue them the approval for their license. Mm -hmm. Now, if in the process, if their license in their state expires, are they supposed to renew their license before then? Okay. Yes. No questions. For me, it is. Yeah. All right. Any other questions that may be out there? Okay. If so, let's. Um, we're off of our uh, agenda items, and we're on public. Yeah. Public yeah. Public comment. comment. Oh, for this item too. Okay. 
Then for this retention schedule, do we have any public comment on the 90 day retention schedule? Good morning, Fred Jones. Uh, just for clarity's sake, <clears throat> to, if I may ask Christy direct questions. Okay. So do you request from the foreign state a certification based on an application applicant's request of you? It depends. Some some applicants already know that they have to get that from their state. So we'll get we'll, we'll we actually get certification lever, letters and never get the application. Right, and that's what I'm trying to understand is they didn't send you an application mm -hmm. for reciprocity and yet you're communicating with their foreign state to get a certification on their behalf. I'm confused. We're not communicating with the states. The states <clears throat> just send them as, you have to pay for a certification letter. So okay. if I'm licensed in Texas, I've gone to Texas and I've paid for a cert, we get an email from Texas and we file it away. Okay, so I'm from Texas. I'm planning to move to California. I ask the state of Texas to send that certification to you. Do you inform me that no. that has been received? No. So the concern I have is I may not know that Texas sent you the certification. We're not going to inform you. I'm going to tell you that right now. We don't have the staff for that. Right. I got that. But <laughs> I mean, this could explain why there may be a delay in my actual application to you because I don't know Texas has already sent that to you. Maybe I'm waiting for Texas to confirm it with me. Um, so anyway, that's the only mild concern I have. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? How many of these certifications just die? Um, we've never counted, but I would say a lot. Really? For whatever reason. Uh, there's, there's unfortunately a lot of fraud in certification letters. So, you know, we, we sometimes I think we're getting certification letters. They've gone to a certification. They've told their friend, go apply in California for this license. I sent a cert, and then they never do it. It happens all the time in every single state. When I meet with executive directors throughout the state, it's our number one topic we talk about. Wow. Even though they're paying for this. Absolutely. We're currently right the now not fee. accepting certifications from another state because we have found a significant fraud issue. And we had, in 2023, we've received over 800 certifications from this state. And every, the past two years, last year was 200, and the year before that was 100 and something. And now this year so far has been over 800. And you've been able to determine that there's fraud involved? Oh, yes. Are we pursuing that? Oh, yes. Good. Good, good, good. We don't want to get away with that. Well, it, that brings my question in as a, on the other side of this, as a salon owner, when someone comes in from, you know, because I have someone now who just came in from another state and I said, you need to apply, like, all this stuff. How, how do we as salon owners protect ourselves in the process with this? I would ask questions. I would ask where they were originally licensed and how they originally got licensed. Because what, what, that what sounds has happened, like a good what open. has happened, what, this has been happening for a long time. Um, someone will go to a state and get a license. They maybe um, some, you know, years ago we had a major issue with, was it Puerto Rico? Mm -hmm. With Puerto Rico. So people were coming in from Puerto Rico, people, they weren't real people, um, and getting licenses based off of fake out of, you know, state or often out of country materials. And so maybe they took went to another state and they didn't look at it as close as some, and now they have a license. Mm -hmm. And so now they're coming to California and they get a license like that. So with this current situation that we have, we have stopped accepting the state's certification letters and we're going to the applicant saying, you're gonna have to prove to us how you got licensed mm -hmm. in the first place. Because what we're finding is, is that the state is getting them from another state who's probably got them from another state. Mm. Somebody found a loophole, they yes. thought, and okay. All right, now we um, go to public comment of items not on the agenda. 
Yes. And no public comment on that. So let's talk amongst us as to committee members uh, suggesting any future agenda items. Is there anything that you think should be discussed by this committee? Crickets? <laughs> Okay, okay, that's okay. That's okay. Yeah, we, there's a lot we're working on, that's, that's for sure, especially a couple of things that came out of today. So in that case, I will mo move that we are adjourned. Adjourned.